You are listening to the Catholic Thinkers Podcast, a free treasury of instruction in the Catholic intellectual tradition. If you enjoy this lecture, please visit us at catholicthinkers.org forward slash donate. This is Father James Scholl. This morning I would like to um, present to you a lecture which is called What is Theology? The lecture was originally published in a uh, intercollegiate studies journal called First Things in 2009. It is worthwhile reflecting on this as we think about the relation of philosophy, theology, politics, history, and other disciplines. I would like to begin by citing two comments, two quotations, one from the French uh, philosopher Rémy Brog, which is called The Legend of the Middle Ages, which is a very good book. He says, quote, Theology is a Christian specialty. To be sure, several religions developed stories of stores of knowledge at times of an extremely high degree of technically and of technicality and subtlety concerning the uh, adventures of the gods regulating the cult due to them and explaining the commandments when such has been uh, emitted but theology as a rational exploration of the divine according to Anselm's program exists only in Christianity. <clears throat> the end of the quote. The second quote is from Samuel Johnson from 1781, in which he said, quote, The peculiar doctrine of Christianity is that of a universal sacrifice and a perpetual propitiation. Other prophets only proclaim the will and the threatening of threatenings of God. Christ satisfied his justice. The end of the quote. In a famous essay, Leo Strauss asked, What is political philosophy? Following Plato, Aristotle, and Aquinas, he advised us to pay particular attention to what is questions. Thus, we have minds to ask, what is courage? What is truth? What is man? What is beauty? What is knowledge? If we already have the courage of Plato's brother Glaucon, we can even ask, what is is? Though most good philosophers do not think is 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 a what. When we have endeavored to answer such questions, we find ourselves wondering, what is the cause or origin of all that is? What is the purpose of everything? Is the world made in justice or something more than justice, as Aquinas surmised? And if we complain about evil, which we cannot avoid uh, noticing, to whom do we complain? Some philosophers pretend it does not exist. Others, as the early Augustine, think that some evil god caused it. This view has the convenient side effect of excusing us without changing us. Some ancient and modern philosophers used to claim that no origin of things could be found, nor, contrary to Aristotle, was an end or purpose found in them either. Whatever is always was, they said. It just keeps coming around again and again and again. That's why it is said we can understand it, anticipate it. But after we think of this round and round affair long enough, we still wonder why does it circle in the way this way and not some other way. 
are not some things also new, things that have never existed before, ourselves at our conception, for instance. Such wonderments bring us to the God question as central to the what is question. With any curiosity at all, like it or not, we must at least wonder about the God question. We find it odd, perhaps, in reading Exodus, a book based basic to our tradition, to hear Moses ask Yahweh who he was. The answer came back, I am who am, a version of the what is question. Similarly, Christ kept asking, who men, who do men say that I am? Or, before Abraham was, I am. Incidentally, the spell check on my computer, when it read the three ams in the previous the sentences, changed them to is. Nothing could prove more clearly that machines do not philosophize about the highest things. Even if we just ask Leo Strauss's question about political philosophy, we find that Aristotle has already asked the same question. After defining science as knowledge through causes, Aristotle said that politics was the highest of the practical sciences, of the sciences that deal with things that could be otherwise. Politics at its highest included a form of knowledge called prudence, rectoratio agibilium, the right reason of things to be done. The politically prudent statesman strove to put a final shape of his intelligence on an act that could be otherwise. That final act, as all human acts, had to be chosen or determined to be what it is. As chosen, it could be good or evil, praised or blamed, noble or despicable. But politics was not the highest science as such. This latter science would be the knowledge of being as being, generally called metaphysics or first philosophy, or at its peak, theology. Aristotle added, to make this point, that if men were the highest beings, politics, not metaphysics, would be the highest science. When politics is thought to be the highest science, that is, a kind of substitute metaphysics by its practitioners, it claims the power to do everything formally attributed to God. To understand this eventuality is why we read Machiavelli. Even today, we see that politicians implicitly make this quasi-divine claim for themselves when their laws and decrees are based on nothing other than their own wills, either individually or collectively. <clears throat> Thus, if we ask the political question, if we are logical, if we want, as philosophy does, to know about the whole, we unavoidably find ourselves before the God question. What is the reason why we do not want to ask this God question? The answer is, we fear a response that we might not like, one that might change our lives. Aristotle hinted at this result, actually. We walk away from the truth. The Roman governor Pontius Pilate became our real patron. 
for this walking away is what he did, even when he, in a famous sentence, was the one who first asked the question, what is truth? That fear of knowing the truth about ourselves and our world again brings us back to Glaucon in the Republic of Plato, the potential philosopher, to the virtue Socrates applied applied to him, namely courage and what it is. Here, however, courage is not a military virtue, but a moral, even intellectual virtue. Socrates called him courageous. In this form, it permits us, prompts us, to listen to answers to philosophical questions from those who know. This is why Glaucon wanted to talk to Socrates. He had the courage to ask him about the truth and to listen to him. <clears throat> but the teacher, as Yves Simon said in a remarkable and memorable passage, can only bring us to the threshold of the truth of things. We have to go the rest of the way ourselves. Knowledge as such is free. No one owns it, and therefore everyone can have it as theirs, but only on its own terms. The truth exists, as the dialogues of Socrates implies, in conversation in testing, in desiring to know. Augustine was like that too as a young man. He was restless and knew that there must be a place, a person, in whom his heart would find rest. In the City of God, he tells us that, quote, there is no reason for a man to philosophize other than to be happy the end of the quote, as if to say that an intimate relation exists between our minds and the reality that they know. So again, the question, what is justice? What is truth? What is the good? Why is there something rather than nothing? Potential philosophers, those who have not yet made up their mind about how they want to uh, they want their souls to look think of these things even when their professors or universities culture or religion does not ask them and to think to philosophize as robert sokolowski said is primarily to make distinctions to say this is not that to contemplate <clears throat> in their uniqueness, many things that are. <clears throat> Plato said the same thing. The truth, he said, is to say of what is, that it is, and of what not is not, that it is not. This power of affirmation and negation is why I often say that we can have no such thing as a university without the constant and delighted reading of Plato. We have not yet attended a university if this reading was not a central part of what we did there. If that continual reading of Plato is not undertaken behind a university's walls, then nothing much that does go on there matters much either. The charm of Plato, as I call it, is not to be missed. In this regard, I just came across a book that two students gave me in January of 2008. It is Robert Short's book, The Parables of Peanuts. In the preface to the 1968 edition, Short recounted the following incident. 
He had given a lecture at a well-known and fashionable New England girls' college. After the lecture, a young lady, in all candor, asked him, Would you mind going over that sin business again? Our teachers here in the religious department have never mentioned it. Short added, I cried and laughed most of the rest of the evening, indeed. And no doubt, what with evil and all that, the sin business still leads to the God question. Most people seem to blame God for this sin business, not themselves. If they read carefully the introductory chapters of Genesis, however, which are at the origin of such speculation, as Nietzsche implied, they might suspect that sin and evil are not properly located in matter or in God. Rather, they are located in a power of their own being, a power that makes them distinct. It allows them to be otherwise than what they ought to choose to be. Politics, Aristotle said, does not make man to be man, but taking him from nature as already man makes him to be good man. Our moral power does not consist in making us what we are, but in our making ourselves into what we ought to be. To know what ought to be implies the knowing of what is not or right to be. It was Augustine, I believe, recalling Plato, who told us that evil and sin are locks of good that should be there. These locks that constitute evil are, are there not because God made us good, uh, but, bec but because he made us also free. Evil and sin are allowed, Augustine said, that greater goods may come about. Such, too, is the import of the citation from Samuel Johnson that I placed at the beginning. Sin is atoned for by sacrifice. To deal with it any other way would be to make us unfree, unfree beings who could not sin and therefore who could not freely choose or love or do what is noble. Without the freedom that flows from our reason, without the possibility of our choosing evil, what it is to be a free human being would simply cease to be. Literally, theology means the logos of theos, that is, what in a systematic manner do we, by the direct use of our minds, know about whether and what God is. In addition, theology asks, about what, if anything, God has revealed to us more than what we can know by our own reasoning. We are thus want to distinguish, which is, as I said, the primary art of philosophy, between natural and revealed theology. The section of Aristotle's metaphysics in which he talked of the ultimate cause of being is considered to be his theology. When Aquinas uses the term later on, he can use it as Aristotle did, that is to ask, what can the human mind by its own powers know of God? Or he can use it <clears throat> as the orderly presentation of what revelation in its documents and tradition has said about God depicted in these sources. Generally, this latter knowledge is considered beyond the power of the human mind itself to prove or know, at least in its two essential features. 
These are that the inner life of the Godhead is a communion of three persons in one nature. Thus God is not, as Aristotle feared, lonely. Secondly, one of these persons, the Word, became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Why then are we, are these positions credible? Why can we believe them? We cannot know them by our own rational powers. <clears throat> the answer is that these theological understandings address themselves to the human mind. If it is itself thinking about the limits of its natural knowledge, it will see that revelation does contain answers to questions that reason cannot by itself answer, though it can formulate their background. Most of these questions have to do with the end of love and friendship, the permanence of our human experience as real beings. <clears throat> this reality is essentially that to which the doctrine of the resurrection responds. It understands the wholeness of our being. The trouble with such thinking is not that it is not true, but, as Chatterton said, that it is too good to be true. Theology will also include what thinkers and saints down the ages have said in their reflections on these same sources. What the Church in its office has defined as authoritative in them remains present. Likewise, theology includes what Aquinas called the preambles of, of the faith. That is, what kind of a mind do we have? What kind of a world is it in which these things said of God are intelligible? Peter Kreft's little book, The Philosophy of Jesus, makes this point about the preambles rather well, as do most of the books of C.S. Lewis and Chesterton. No book is better here than Robert Sokolowski's The Phenomenology of the Human Person, whose daunting title obscures its essential clarity about what we are and how we know and what the world is like. Our minds are given to us to capture the world intellectually and indeed to fashion it to our own purposes. It exists for us. We do not exist for it as if the world in some sort of higher being is some sort of a higher being than our personal existence itself. Augustine, recalling Cicero, spoke of a civic theology, a poetic theology, and a natural theology. Civic theology meant what the laws and customs of the polity established as their proper way to worship the gods. Poetic theology meant the way the gods were pictured <clears throat> in the poets particularly Homer and Virgil. Natural theology meant what we could conclude to what we could conclude to about the origins of our being and its causes by the use of our reason. Cicero did not write against a background of revelation, as did later philosophers. Thus for him the whole pagan philosophical tradition a fact that constitutes one of the great values to us. Reason and metaphysics are the highest sciences in that tradition. Do not listen to those who tell us otherwise, as Aristotle warned us. Political or civil theology is not itself a claim to reason other than the sort of practical reason that wants some order in religious rites that does not threaten the civil order. Pagan religions generally did not have any concern 
or much concerned with doctrine or morals, which was Plato's concerned about it, why he was concerned about them, and Augustine also. In the beginning, I cited Remy Brog's remark that, properly speaking, theology only exists in, a, in the Christian tradition. Brog cites with favor the remarkable book of Harold Berman, Law and Revolution. It spells out how Christianity came to found, usually through canon law, the assumptions of Western political order. Strauss likewise had made the same point that Brog stresses, namely that the Jewish and Muslim traditions do not have a theology in the Christian sense. They are not taken up with the intellectual side of what their revelation stands for, as if it is addressed to reason. Both of these are religions of law, that is, Islam and, and Judaism. The law is set down in the books. The pious man wants to know whether this act is permitted or not permitted to do according to the law. The religious leader is essentially a lawyer who interprets law. Christianity is not a set of laws. It is an event inciting us to understand its meaning. It distinguishes God and Caesar, man, world, and cosmos. But it does not deny the validity of any of them or their intelligibility in their own spheres. As Pope Benedict said in his remarkable uh, philosophic Regensburg lecture, the early Christians did not address themselves to other religions, but to the philosophers. It was not <clears throat> an accident that Paul was sent to Macedonia, to Greece, the land of the philosophers. Christian theology, that is, what it says about God, is addressed to the human intellect that it might know and understand. Theology, then, does not arise out of itself, however much it might appear to do so by the dogmatic secularist. It is helpless without philosophy if it wants to explain what it knows of man, the world, and of God. But its sources are given to it in the, in the beginning. It, is not, it did not invent the account of reality found in the sources of Revelation. Anselm and Augustine combined to tell us that what we believe in Revelation seeks intelligence. This does not mean that it does not already have an intelligence to it. It is, in fact, suffused with intelligence. What Revelation seeks is the intelligence of those who are already philosophizing. As Benedict pointed out, with Aristotle and with Chesterton, moreover, philosophy is not an esoteric, academic discipline that thinks its purpose is to explain science. <clears throat> it is a way of life that seeks to know and articulate the truth in the deepest sense. And on the side of reason, it too seeks faith. Not faith in the sense of blind program but in the sense of further explaining what anyone can know by itself. When it confronts revelation with its own reason, it somehow becomes reason, that is, becomes more philosophical. It is, if it has sought the truth, it can see that some sort of reason is found in the accounts found in Revelation. They are a part of the whole to which philosophy must be open. 
What then is theology? It is not its own boss, but it is in what it knows of God through revelation, directed to and uses reason to understand what is given to it. This is why Bragg says that theology as such, as a rational explanation of the divine, only exists in Christianity. Here he is simply saying that Christianity, for better or worse, does something no one else does. It seeks to take what it knows of God in its revelation and see how this revelational context relates to reason. In effect, it thinks that by seeing the confrontation between reason and, and revelation, it makes reason to be more reason. When Aquinas spoke of theology, he used the term sacra doctrina, sacred doctrine. Here he spoke, here the word doctrine means what is understood. The point is says, all things that are treated in sacred doctrine are treated under the light or intelligibility of God because either they are God himself or because they have a relation to God as their beginning or end. This formality of seeing all things in the light of what God revealed is itself rooted in a higher reason that remains directed to and respectful of our reason as it, is, as it seeks out the best it can, the reasons for its own strange activity. This is the reason we call philosophizing. The activity, as we call philosophizing, the activity that has no other purpose for existing than, as Augustine said, to make us happy. The end of the lecture. We hope you enjoyed listening to Catholic Thinkers. Please visit us at catholicthinkers.org forward slash donate to help us keep this content free.